Greetings and welcome to you, brave citizens of our new world. I'm Toronto's greatest supervillain and evil genius, Dr. Terawatt. This is our Layer 3.1, and today is our third Questions Thursday. Yes, I just got a haircut, and yes, I just got out of the shower, so I'm still a bit, uh, slick right now. <laughs> but let's see what questions we have. These days we have been seeing a lot of people suddenly joining in these fads of not vaccinating their kids and going on these crazy diets where all they eat is celery, all because of false medical information that they get from Dr. TV show man who might not actually be a doctor, or from research that has been disproved or blown out of proportion. How would you deal in the new world with the spread of false information and those who choose to do things that could jeopardize the health of themselves, their family, and possibly their community? Quad, building a community, a world that is based on truth rather than money is truthfully not going to be easy. <laughs> a lot of people have gotten used to the idea of just doing things for the next dollar or for their bottom line. A lot of scientists can't publish any of their research and get paid unless they sensationalize it, so they have to write those kinds of crazy headlines. Or in some cases, they fully lie get paid to do so by certain organizations, and then very much like this whole, uh, you know, the vaccinations cause autism debacle, the lie gets pretty much halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. Even when that scientist was discredited and disproven, even when that scientist fully came forward saying that they were coerced and paid into providing this false information, even then, the, the a lot of parts of society still don't trust that that is the, the thing that's really going on. There's always going to be conspiracy theorists who are always going to say things like, oh, well, that's just what they want you to think, and oh, well, they were paid to say that, and oh, the, the, the scientist was speaking the truth the first time, but then got paid to, to spread a lie about how vaccinations work and blah, blah, blah. Ignorant people are always going to be a thing, so building a community uh, and a world that's based on truth is going to be kind of lengthy, but... That being said, there will also be other things in place. Spreading misinformation straight up will be illegal. So if you do knowingly spread false information, then you will be held accountable for that. And the freedoms that people have to choose whether or not they get to vaccinate their children will no longer be a freedom. It will be mandated by the local government and enforced by law that your kids need to get vaccinated because if you don't, then they become a health risk to everyone else that's around them. As you say, the problem with using the best stuff first is that if they survive, all you have is essentially numbers. But wouldn't the fact of using a scale of increasing difficulty obstacles cause a more rapid growth of adaptation to your style and technological superiority? I mean, you don't let disease adapt to your antibiotics by starting a subject on a minuscule dosage. Yes and no. And it's, and it's very much the same thing of what, of what I said previously, whereas if you know that your best stuff will get the job done thoroughly and 100% you know that it's going to work, then use it. I'm not against that. But if I had to shut down the facility and put everything on red alert every time some old lady accidentally wandered into the facility or something like that, then we'd get nothing done. If you can see that there's a problem that could be handled by two or three security guards, then handle it with two or three security guards. Don't launch your orbital lasers to deal with five spunky kids with magnifying glasses every time they wander into one of your facilities. Not only is it a waste of resources, it's also a waste of a lot of people's time. And again, in the event that you are facing an enemy, you are not sure what they're capable of. And if you put your best stuff first and they survive that, you've nothing to fall back on. But if you use your lighter stuff first, and as they're cutting their way through your lighter defenses, slowly working their way up the ladder, you have the opportunity, not only is it buying you time, but also you can observe the methods that they're using to fight you, and you can adapt your defensive strategies on the fly to deal with that particular incursion. So somebody shows up on your evil volcano island and starts working their way into your facility and you have no idea what they're capable of, halfway through as they're getting in through the gate and cutting through your guys, you notice that they don't use ranged weapons whatsoever and that that might be a gap in their defenses. So you send in a bunch of people with assault rifles, problem solved. Or vice versa, this person only comes in using like two assault rifles, jump them with martial artists or whatever, like get in close and deal with the problem hand to hand because maybe that's a gap in their skill set. Using your best stuff first can put you at such a disadvantage if you use that and then they survive it. It's crushing the morale for all the, the minions and whoever other soldiers you have on your side to try and defend you. But it also gives them the opportunity to immediately jump to facing you directly as opposed to any other defenses that you've put in place. So, Doc, have you ever dealt with a hero pretending to be a villain to gather intel or undermine an evil operation, like Robin dressing as Red X or Leia dressing as a bounty hunter? How did slash would you weed them out? 
I mean, for, for the most part, like, 9 out of 10 times, heroes pretending to be villains are super obvious. Like, they, they're, they're not very good at sort of keeping themselves under lock and key, keeping themselves sort of in check, more or less. They're easy to spot, they're just the, the, the way that they talk and how they carry themselves. Additionally, most heroes just don't have the stomach for a lot of the things that we do in evil organizations, so... But there's always that every now and then that they send somebody who's really good and that person gets in, and you just have to... Wait until they make themselves obvious. Wait until they stab you in the back. Because weeding some of those people out can be very difficult, but everything that you might put in place to try and stop them, like uh, scanners or mind-reading equipment to try and figure out who they are, they'll have a way around that. The forces of justice will always have a means by which to try and sort of get past any defenses you have in place. That being said, trust, in this case, isn't your enemy. Don't stop trusting all the people that are working with you or for you just because you're afraid that one of them might be a problem. Wait until that person proves themselves to not be worthy of your trust or your time or admiration or respect. Weed them out and keep moving forward. Hello to the most glorious Dr. Terawatt. I mean, it's, it's a compliment, but also there's only one of me, so... <laughs> when you take over, how are you going to deal with people inevitably looking for a scapegoat if something goes wrong? Have you ever thought about a system involving heroes and villains who are basically paid actors that are only around for something to look up to? And to have something to blame? If not, how are you going to deal with the fact that people tend to get stupid in big groups? Again, it's building a culture and a society that's based on truth and honesty is going to be difficult in its implementation, but a lot of the things that I'm implementing require at least one generational flop. So the previous generation are people that grew up in a society and a culture that was built on lies, misinformation, and greed. The next generation of people will be born into a world that is putting honesty first, being transparent with everything that's going on. So you're, you're not going to have to worry about that kind of stuff. Um, God, they have a they have a word for it, and I'm trying to think of it. I can't remember the, the name of it off the top of my head, but it's it's basically the the, the psychology that um, my father grew up in this house, and there's a river next door, and there were always turtles in that river. But as my father grew older in this house, all of those turtles died off. By the time I was born, living in this house, there were no turtles there. So as far as I'm concerned, there were never turtles there. The next generation of people will wonder why we didn't have machines doing automated enforcement. They'll wonder why we were so dishonest with each other and so greedy all the time. Hey Doc, glad to have you back. My question is that in this brave new world in which people live forever and superhero groups are no longer needed, what will happen to other evil organizations that wish to not imprecise your rule? Never seen that word before. P.S. Me and my associates have fanboyed over what you do and created our own clan of evil and wish not get crushed by the Mechanolith Mark II. Here's the thing. Like, is the modus operandi of your evil organization just wanton destruction and getting in the way? If that's true, then you're going to find yourself under either my boot or someone else's. If you are, much like some other folks, looking to make things better, then you can join up with an evil organization like ours that is looking to see that done. A lot of the times, the villain's worst enemy ends up being other villains who either have similar goals and don't want to share, or who have conflicting goals. I am trying to make the world a better place, and I often discuss in detail through the panels that I do at conventions how I'm going to make the world a better place. But if that's not something that you're doing, then you would be in a p opposition of what it is that I'm trying to achieve, and therefore there's going to be conflict. I love to make humans scared, yet I'm hailed as a hero. Am I missing something here? No, that's pretty standard fare for humans. What are you going to do to convince me that my side project isn't worth continuing, considering the reason I'm a villain and that Walt, though slow, is basically unstoppable at this point? The mold creature to which you've allied yourself, though extraordinarily powerful, I would not be so hubris as to say is unstoppable. That being said, in the world that I'm attempting to create, there will be room for yourself and for entities like Walt to remain undisturbed. And it's not necessarily humans, I think, that are the problem. It is just our current nature that is the problem. And I feel that it can be corrected rather than erased. I'm curious, why do you leave the magic up to the like of Professor Hades and other magical folk in your employ? Is it due to just being the son of scientists, magic being more fickle than science, or any other reason I might not be thinking of? Honestly, I'm just better at science. I just, you know, it's, it's kind of a do-what-you-know sort of situation. Uh, I have a natural aptitude towards scientifics, so that's the path I've chosen. 
Hey Doc, thanks for your assistance in building the fictional dimensional transporter, and with that DS chip that caused some trouble back in 2017, I've got a question for you. My cybernetic android is going through some memory card problems and some glitches in her system. How can I fix this problem to improve her abilities? Jack, I'm going to just go out on a limb here and assume that you're attempting to house her mainframe and a lot of her other integral systems inside her avatar and she's walking around. What I would suggest is creating a larger, beefier mainframe that's stable and is external to the avatar that she walks around in. So a large mainframe, subterranean, preferably, just to keep it out of harm's way and keep it sort of off the grid, more or less, and have that be able to hook up in one fashion or another to the avatar which she uses to explore and interact with her environment. That way, in the event that she gets destroyed, you're not losing everything, and it allows you to create a more sophisticated mainframe and brain, more or less, for her system. What is the difference between layer 3.0 and layer 3.1? More or less just upgrades in technology. I moved some furniture around. Duracell or Energizer batteries? I've always been a Duracell kid. Ow, oh, Doc, when did you install the lasers to keep me from getting close to your lair? Cat Monroe, I installed those uh, systems a ways back and managed to integrate some of your DNA into the optics defense matrix so they have your biometrics. Stay off my lawn. Given your recent foray into DMing, which looks awesome by the way, what is your favorite creature you've put in game? Beholder, Owlbear, a nice couple of rock trolls running a reputable tavern with an adorable baby? <laughs> While the greys are uh, quite fun, I'm always a fan of the goblins that I've created. Back when I first got into D&D, I was more or less strong-armed into it by my brother when I first moved to Toronto when I was 18. He was running a game and we ran into a bunch of goblins and he was just kind of doing silly voices for them and I thought it was so funny. We never did, really did anything else other than just fight the goblins and move on to other things. So I decided when I attempted to run my very first game, which was 4th edition Dungeons and Dragons like a, years and years ago, I just on a whim had my fighters fighting their way through a sort of clan of goblins and at one point they decided to spare one so I decided to do the same voice that my brother did and thus was born uh, Goober the Goblin and his very favorite jar of bugs. <laughs> that campaign didn't really last a lot as a lot of the people that were there sort of dispersed after a game or two so when I started running the most recent campaign that we've been doing on our Twitch channel, link down below, I decided to sort of bring that character back and not only Goober the Goblin but also his best friend Fibj. And it seems that a lot of people have really fallen in love with the character, and I'm glad for that because I really enjoyed making that character and sort of introducing it and role-playing it with you guys and uh, having it sort of interact with and banter with some of the people in our party. And that is all the questions that we have for today. So thank you everybody for coming on out, for asking your questions, for being great people. Of course, if you have any other questions, leave them in the comment section down below and I will get to them next Thursday. And until next time, my brave citizens, I'm Toronto's greatest supervillain and evil genius, Dr. Terawatt. This is our 3.1 and I'll see you on the war front. End of line.